Hello everybody, I'm Lavis, and today I'm going to tell you about the SCP Tales of Remembrance. The Remembrance series of tales give a lot of information and insight into the Syncope Symphony and the Kirk Lawnwood High School. On its own though, these tales may be confusing, so I've put together a playlist on my channel containing all of my discussions concerning the symphony. With that being said, let's begin. Remembrance Prelude First Bell this document contains an image taken from a high school yearbook with the photos of many students and their respective senior quotes. Johan Winterson, thanks for the memories. Clarice Patrick, I'll see you all soon, keep in touch. Gordon Crook, Carpe Diem. Hannah Silver, what a wonderful year, too bad that idiot has to spoil it. Augustus Smith, Semper Fi. Margaret Rickers, break a leg. Samuel Watson, good luck to all of you, except for <coughs> Jennifer Sontag, funniest moment this year, when <coughs> fell on his ugly face. Arthur York, we would have won if it wasn't for that sore loser. George Rogers, some people are useless. Audrey Donald, when <coughs> gasked me out, I felt sick. Percy Canyon, we're going to get that back. Sally Conroy, you reap what you sow. Curtis Sanders, I don't think anything more needs to be said. Jennifer Danvers, I'm glad that will do nothing with his life. Thomas Gifford, I hope that one day gets cancer. Remembrance Part 1, June 12th, 1976. Hi, my name's Lee. If you're reading this, it is very likely that I will be extraordinarily upset with you, because this is a personal journal I bought yesterday at the new Montgomery Ward. Anyways, here's some stuff about me, since that seems to be what you're supposed to do when you use a journal. I'm 17 years old, and I'm a senior attending Kirk Longwood High, where I do marching band stuff. I also collect coins, which is not too exciting to some people but I like it. When I graduate, I'd like to do something in engineering, but if that doesn't pan out, it might be nice to do something with mechanics. School isn't really a huge thing. I've got band and my friends. We mostly just mess around in the band room, practicing, going to other classes, then going back to band after class ends. It's actually pretty routine. The other band members aren't really interesting. Cindy's nice, but she doesn't really talk to me. Albert is the band leader, and he doesn't really do much other than boss us around when we BS him. June 13th, 1976 oh, What a crummy day. There's a game coming up tomorrow to decide who gets to play in the county finals, so of course we got to march around roasting in the sun as we do the same maneuvers over and over and over. Ugh, went on forever. At least we had water, so nobody passed out from the heat this time. Abby's still pretty embarrassed about that one. The rest of the day was just as blech. First period was just boring, boring, boring. Mr. Collins just kept talking about sports, which I guess is what happens when you put the football coach in charge of a math class. Daniel was just being an asshole, babbling on with him about it. It would have been nice to learn something before I fail the next test. But whatever, guess I'll just flunk again. Damn it, I need this credit for the mechanic scholarship. I was talking to Cindy today, and she was really peeved that a bunch of after school stuff is getting cancelled. There's money issues or something. It's really a lame situation, I'm really upset about it too. If they cut the shop, I'd be out of luck. Just crossing my fingers that they can work something out. June 14th, 1976 that game was a massacre. We crushed them. It started as a pretty close call, but by the second half, we were basically untouchable. Coach was joking about how the uniforms were the key to the game. They're pretty cool looking, I guess. They bought them from a cheaper place this time. Cinephone or something. But it turned out really awesome. Hope we get new uniforms for the finals. Crap, I just realized how much more band work I'm gonna have to do. June 15th, 1976. 
Someone busted our front window today while everyone was out of the house at school. I didn't get home until 6 or so, band practice, and I almost cut my foot on one of the more jagged pieces. Note to self, double bag glass next time. Glass cuts are not fun. June 17th, 1976. Got to talk to Cindy today. My spit valve busted and I didn't have anything to practice with. She was really nice, talked almost the whole period and then some more after school. Should see if she'd be interested in hanging out sometime, maybe going to town or someplace like that. But first thing is to take care of getting the valve fixed ASAP. I should check on my savings jar. I just got back from going to the new music store downtown. Apparently, it's from the same outfit that gave us the uniforms, and they're called Syncope Symphony. It's a really excellent store, they've got tons of stuff for such a small place. I even got a big discount for being a student at Kirk Lawnwood. Definitely going back soon if I can. Just have to close my eyes and follow the beat. I also hit up the coin shop, but there wasn't much of interest, and the good stuff cost too much. June 18th, 1976. Went to do a babysitting job today for one of Dad's friends. I'm usually not a guy who likes kids, but they were alright. They were old enough that I didn't have to change diapers or anything, and they were nice enough. We pretty much just watched TV the whole time I was over there. Parents gave me 30 bucks, which I'm gonna spend on some coins I saw. Oh, just remembered what we were watching. It was that old Batman TV show. Na 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 na. June 20th, 1976. Cindy and I were talking again today about the clubs and stuff. I told her that if she was gonna be bored from missing her clubs, we could hang out or whatever. I really do enjoy talking to her, we've got a good rhythm, talking words together and coming out harmoniously. We decided to hit up the Renmar Theater to see some movie. I don't even remember which one we picked out. June 22nd, 1976. I just remembered something from the other day. A lot of the stuff in town was closing up. There was that Sunoco store, but the grocer, barber, and a bunch of other places just looked abandoned. I stopped at Sunoco to get something for Cindy's birthday. The store was still nice, but it had different people working there. Not that they'd say that, according to them, they're working with the store. They were just really strange beyond that. I saw one guy mop the same spot on the floor for the entire two hours that I was shopping. He just whistled the same 10 second tune over and over. Was a nice tune so it didn't bug me, but it was weird. Catchy too. June 25th, 1976. Went to the counselor to talk about career options. There wasn't a lot to go on locally, but up in Reskin, they have a college with a pretty good mechanical engineering program. It'll cost a pretty penny, might need to dip into my savings again. I really don't want to have to sell any of my coins, but if it comes down to college or coins, I'm gonna have no other option. June 29th, 1976. Been busting my a with practice. We've been going out every day to try to get ready for the big game. Of course, Collins picks the hardest and most backwards routine he can think of, and expects us to have it perfect in four weeks. We're starting some more intense training this week, which is gonna be miserable. If we weren't already in intense training, I really don't want to see what it is. I placed an ad in the paper for some of my coins today. I tried to pick the ones I could part with and still had value. Haven't gotten any calls yet, but it might have come in while I was out. We really need an answering machine. June 30th, 1976. As part of the new training schedule, we've been given some vitamin pills or something to keep us up during practice. They're little chiclet pills, don't even need any water to swallow them. Take two in the morning and one in the evening. Those glass shard cuts still aren't all the way healed. Dang. July 3rd, 1976. Sold the coins today. The clinking and the clanking as I handed them over was really nice. Made me think of pennies on a drum. The money's gone to the saving jar, and I'll talk to a counselor after we finish up the season. July 6th, 1976. Training has started. We are doing excellent work together, stepping in beat with our sound and in synchrony with the metronome. Just march to the beat, Cindy and Randy and Greg around me. 
we march in solidarity together unified with the miracle of sound. Someone has to keep the beat to the world. We're giving them the greatest show they've ever seen. This game will be more memorable for the halftime band than the players. July 9th, 1976. The radio was really good today. The sound slithered through the holes in the fiber cloth, curling around the wooden frame and emanating itself to me. We listened for almost all of yesterday and the day before, and I didn't even notice. Time sure flies by when you listen to it. July 11th, 1976. It's a distraction. We march every day, keeping the beat. There isn't time to play games, Cindy. I know you read this. I know you've been tearing the pages to write your own personal symphony. Well, I can tell you that you're just a roll of quarters stuck inside the cash machine, not hearing the chime of changing hands above you. Things are different now. They're always going to be. I remember changes before or later. Sometimes it's hard to decide. July 15th, 1976. I'm not hungry anymore. We talk to each other and play one another and make them into the notation. We're conducted together. Who needs free breakfast, lunch, and dinner when you're part of a bigger piece? Cindy was eating. She can. I have a life to live. God, my stomach is twisting itself tighter than a violin string right before it snaps. July 18th, 1976. Before we met, I was a pitcher of water, sloshing around and holding all my notions in my skull. My flow was stagnant, and I couldn't walk with my fellows. We had to break the glass, let it fall to pieces, let it sink into the sides of our heads. Rattles around until all the pieces catch. I needed you to put it back together again, with the cracks showing. It comes in like a fountain now, and I know so much. I remembered how we used to sing. First interlude. Old school. We are going to have a great year, aren't we? From the girl who sat behind you. First note. Students, please be advised that class scheduling will begin this Saturday in the auditorium. Please remember to bring your class request forms as well as being ready to spend time with a guidance counselor about possible choices. Seniors, if you wish to enlist in dual enrollment, please see Mr. Werner in his office after school. We hope each one of you has a wonderful second semester. Second note. Congratulations to the Fightin' Lions who won their way to the finals yesterday. After a close first quarter, we were able to shut them down for the rest of the game. An unbelievable upset in victory. Please congratulate Coach Collins if you see him on your way to class or in the halls. Students are reminded to donate to the annual fundraising for extracurricular activities. Although Syncope has been very generous in their donations, we still need your contributions. Note 3. New bus schedule. Students displaced in buses 23, 11, and 24 have been returned to their normal schedule. Note 4. Note from Mr. Wallach to all band members. Intensive training begins Monday. Please come prepared each day to practice. Note 5. A new lunch menu has been announced, aimed to serve students who have been spending more time at school for extracurricular activities. It is being offered free to any student in a program sponsored by Syncope. Note 6. New bus schedule removed. Note 7. Students, if you feel strong enough, please rest with our brothers. See how the formula all comes together to make one tablature. Note 8. Hello students, this is Principal Werner. Mitchell decided that it was high time to take a step back in responsibility and that he's going to groove to another beat. That's okay. We will grow onwards. Like the spire of the Eiffel Tower, we will inspire many people to create the parachute so that they may safely live with the stars. Nobody will be excluded from further activity. We've brought everyone here to be together. Have a good year. Note 9. Students, please stand with me for the Pledge of Symphonic Allegiance and sing your hearts out with style. Note 10. Some have said that it was the new system that caused them to part. Those of you who do are warned. 
The director will hear of anything we say. He's listening to all of us now, hearing the rhythm of the panting and the running crowds, the bells and the blackboards, its harmony. Note 11. Rest. Note 12. Students are reminded that only band members are permitted off-school premises. Any violators will deal with their own consequences. They have only themselves with their own actions. Remembrance Part 2 Lee was there, walking through the dead halls and broken doors in his pressed uniform. They'd left him behind. Everyone else had been taken out to play. Lee continued his march. They would be back soon. Syncope would always have a place for his percussion. Above him, the announcers added their steps to the beat. Lee looked up, keeping in step to see what the tune would be today. Hello, student. This is Principal Werner. Mitchell decided that it was high time to take a step back in responsibility and that he's going to groove to another beat. That's okay. We will grow onwards. Like the spire of the Eiffel Tower, we will inspire many people to create the parachute so that they may safely live with the stars. Nobody will be excluded from further activity. We've brought everyone here to be together. Have a good year. The rest of the school didn't seem to mind. Some of them had kept acting like nothing had changed, walking like scarecrows in a dead field. Some just sat there, watching people go by. Lee didn't care to ask them what they were looking at. He remembered walking down the hall, seeing the old faces singing. When their voices gave out, they whistled. And when the lips went out, they beat the drums. Students, maybe you have noticed the new schedule system. We've divided everyone into the six populations and given them each their own positions in the school. I know this radical restructuring seems to have come from nowhere, but trust us, it's been a long time coming. Please stand with me for the Pledge of Symphonic Allegiance and sing your hearts out with style. Syncope was here. Lee could feel it in his sinews, twanging them like a banjo. From the band equipment came its force and its glory. Before he could go on to think of eleven new wonderful things to say about the matter, Lee clenched his fists. Legs turned to run, but only at an awkward stance. The vibrations in his sinews grappled him by the lapels and pushed him forward like a wind-up clock. Students, we are sad to report that we've had to let some staff and students go. Although they were bravely carrying on in their duties, in the end there is room for only so many in the orchestra of life. Please, listen in silence as we commemorate those who have gone to another place. They hear of anything we say. All of us now, hearing the rhythm of the panting, running crowds, the bells and the blackboards, the song. Lee stopped playing. Cold pains were in him. Oh god, it hurts. The things clawed into his back from his arms, twisting up to his head. This isn't harmony. He tried to take a step, but fell, sprawling his limbs akimbo as he slammed into the ground. Where was his place in the symphony? It was punishment. An arm stretched out, grabbing for purchase. He needed to get out. Playing was all he needed to do. Cindy and all the others would be waiting for him there, to play with. Panting, he clutched his chest. An icy bubble welled in his chest and pressed against him. He couldn't breathe, think, Oh God, where is this all going? How do... No, please, have to remember. Now, rest. A rising crescendo was there, faint at first, but growing. Weakly, he pursed his lips and croaked out a whistle. The crescendo grew. Oh, the beauty, the grace. Let it take him, bring him back to his note. Lee closed his eyes and slept. Hey, find any more? One. Guy who looked like he'd been in the band. Found him in the upstairs hall, having some kind of fit. Put him in the, uh, third room, I think. Some agent should be giving class A's and dropping them later. Can I get a hand? These kids are kinda heavy. Students are reminded that only band members are permitted off-school premises. 
Any violators will deal with their own consequences. Their actions have only themselves. Lee woke up on his back, facing up to some place in the dark. With a throbbing heart, he swiveled his head back and forth, trying to hear it. There was only a low buzzing, sounding like a lean, hungry mosquito. No melody, no tune. Taking a step, his leg nearly buckled beneath him. Clutching his leg to keep from falling over, he didn't feel the suit. Just thin, bare cloth. Uniform gone. Instrument gone. Music gone. Lee tried to step again, sluggishly stumbling. Why did they send him? These things happened before there was a reason for them not to, so it should be over. The buzzing grew louder. Lee had to get back. Home. School was home. Lee struggled, the pounding slithering up from his heart, through the throat, and to his head. They were doing the music, and he had to be there now. Someone said something. Please. They said to forget. Lee shook his head, tears streaming down his cheeks. Sin, how did the tune go? What did they sing? They never sang, Lee. You forgot. It's so easy to forget, isn't it? The ringing grew louder, and they stopped talking to him. Louder and wider. We won't forget you. Second Interlude In Session Do you remember when the bells had to ring? Can you tell me how the children used to sing? From An Unknown Admirer Note 1 We're finally leaving for the trip. It's been a hell of a ride getting here, but now we have it. A whole summer on the road. Nothing in our way but the freedom to ride the bends, turning wherever we feel like, whenever we feel like. Rusty has his dad's wrecked up old Chevy for us to ride in, and he's gonna be driving. Note 2. First day of the drive, and I'm pumped. We got Rusty in front, Lee in the passenger seat, with me and Andy chilling in the back. It's pretty nice. First place we're hitting up is the Black Ridge Rockstravaganza. I remember going there. It was amazing. Really what opened me up to my interest in rock. Everyone is going to have a blast. Cindy and Lee are real pumped up for it. I hope they don't end up passed out drunk on the field again. Note 3. Driving down every road in Ohio must get boring after a while, but Rusty manages to keep us going. I remember him telling all these wise remarks about passing landmarks and people, but that was only when we were in the city. This is farmland. I can't write right now. My head is… blah. Note 4 On the road again, I remember the roads again. Note 5 we must be lost. I don't recall ever having been stuck this long without seeing an open road or a turn or even another house. All we get is this one straight, flat road stretching on for what seems like ages. God, this is turning out to be a less than stellar opening to our last memorable summer. Note 6. Rusty is an idiot. The first house we see for days and he bolts by it. Apparently, he had bad memories about the place, or some other hippie bullshit like that. You can't freaking have memories of stuff you never saw. Then he has the nerve to not let anyone else drive, because he's supposed to be the driver. Wait, I forgot, did Lee ever drive? Note 7. We left Rusty here today. When we came back, he was gone. Note 8. The car is longer now. I don't know how, but I do. The lights in my teeth are getting brighter, and the eyes of my light are brighter. I'm sharp. Remembrance Part 3 Lee checked his watch, like he always did, and stepped over the welcome mat. He was home. It wasn't a particularly impressive home, with its threadbare red carpets and grimy, unwashed windows, but it was his home. He'd owned his own place for about three years and wasn't exactly inclined to go back to his parents' spare room. 
There were enough withering looks passed around during the holidays they bothered to visit for, thank you very much. Mom was disappointed in his college days. His engineering plans had fallen through when he didn't make it to the college. He'd tried his best, but the environment was just too hostile. He'd had to sell the rest of the coins just to stay afloat from the student loans. Dad was cross because Granddad's coins had gone with them, but Granddad would have wanted him to be safe, rather than in jail with some shiny Polish change. Well, Granddad had been through a lot to get the coins too, but no, he would have agreed. The job he'd gotten was paying his bills. He'd been entering data at the bank for about three years now, and it paid most of the bills. Mortgage and water were the main two. Sometimes electric or gas had to go by the wayside. The job was still better than nothing. Plus, it let him spend some time out of the house, which was always better than being alone. Mail was tossed on the counter and temporarily forgotten as Lee crouched over his fridge. It was mostly empty, but there was still one soda left. Mail continued to wait, watching as he set himself up with a glass and two iced cubes. Lee pulled up a wicker chair and began to flick through the envelopes. There was a couple bills for the cable and from Bell, some junk mail asking him if he was a bad enough dude to learn karate, and something else. The sorting went on for a minute or so as Lee rechecked his envelopes to make sure they were really for him, and opening the ones which required to be open, and as one can imagine, he found this to be quite tedious. The chair legs scuffed the tiles as he stood up to go which is what he would have done had he not spotted a red envelope sticking underneath the rest of his mail stack. It wasn't a fancy envelope, with just paper, his address, and no return address. Lee wasn't a suspicious man, but this letter still ticked off some alarms in his mind. He shook it, poked it, prodded it, dropped it, and a variety of other trials to determine any malicious content. The letter remained inert. With the letter's mundanity satisfied, he opened it, slowly tearing from one corner to another. Reaching inside, there wasn't any paper, just a Polaroid. Just? Lee squinted at it. He was sure it couldn't have been a picture of him. How could it be? There wasn't anything left from those days. He blinked, rubbed his eyes, then looked again. The picture refused to change and faced him indifferently. It was him, Cindy, and Andy. They were grinning stupidly at someone who was taking the picture. Lee blinked, and the wicker chair creaked as he sat down again. This was from the trip Lee had taken with Rusty and the others in 76. It hadn't been a particularly exciting trip, and the hubbub of almost college had entered his mind almost directly after they'd gotten home. Kirk Lawnwood High had been one of the last times he'd been happy. The familiar tendrils of nostalgia began to creep over his shoulders as he stared. You should have stayed home with them. Lee shook his head, trying to clear his thoughts and not succeeding. The photo slipped out of his fingers, fluttered down onto the counter. Lee closed his eyes, giving himself rationalizations and condolences. He was okay. There was a good purpose for him here, and he was living his own life. Going back would have been a dumb thing to do now, with all the time that's passed. When he opened his eyes, he saw a message scrawled on the back of the letter. We've had a great year, haven't we? Hope to see you again soon. Love, Cindy. XOXOXOX. Sleep didn't come to Lee easily that night. Images of photographs, red, his friends driving, listening to the radio, and everything else from the summer came flooding back to him. Touching his lips where Cindy had kissed him, he pursed them together and thought about his life now. Dwelling in the past would get him nowhere. The photo would be off his nightstand and in the bin by tomorrow. We are hitting up the amusement park later today if Rusty and Andy can get the driver navigator mechanic going. Honestly, it seems like they each have their own ideas of how we should get there. I'd volunteer, but that'd probably just cause more drama. The blaring of an alarm yanked Lee from his sleep, and he spasmed with a start. Rise from bed, eat two scoops of cereal, no milk, shave after combing hair, get dressed with shoes, pants, shirt, go to the mirror to button the coat, then undo and button the right way, then out the door. 
The whole day was uneventful, except for the niggling little gremlins in his mind that had been awakened from the photo. As boredom wafted in, he tried to think about where the trip had taken him. Did it really matter? The picture was still there. The bin was there so it could be dealt with for good. It was probably just from some ass who hated him back home. Maybe he should keep it then, in case more photos come in. Just in case. The photograph ended up tucked within a jacket pocket. That whole year was a blur. The summer was what had counted. Everything that had happened, then and now, came from that trip. Building up a whole year for one last summer, then f***ing his life away afterwards. But the summer had been a golden moment between them, where nothing mattered and you could do what you want. A great end to a year of build-up. Instinctively, he reached his hand into the jacket pocket to touch the photo. Still there. Sleep came easier that night with the painful memories of the day before replaced with more palatable memories of nostalgia. All the good times at school, even before the trip, band had been fun. That's where he'd met Cindy. They'd been partners for band stuff, and he'd help her with... Lee frowned and glanced back at the photo. Where had Cindy met him? Something about the d money was the last I heard. She smiled at him, and he returned the gesture. The school was in some tough times, but it gave him an excuse to talk to her. Speculate on whether or not the place downtown could supply... Syncope. Lee bolted up, grabbing at everything around him as he scrambled out of bed. Hearing a buzz, his hands instinctively went to cover his ears, and teeth bit tongue. How could he have forgotten syncope? Why should he remember it? He fell back onto his bed, clutching his throbbing skull. They'd been something at Lawnwood. Wincing, he felt blood stream down from his nose, pooling in his lips. There was something about syncope. Remember. They would remember you. Pieces flooded his consciousness. There was a school he couldn't leave. His bandmates at the game. And syncope. They'd been a group at the school. They were there from town. No, that was wrong. Lee wiped the blood and looked back to his nightstand, to the photo. It looked the same. The buzzing grew louder. Lee could hear it. Very sorry. Know you are unhappy here and apologize for the times done to. Frustration and fear and are willing to work with if only take the time to see the overall composure. Know that many of have been hurt or set to tower for the goal, but were only for the beat. Have to make some practices to bring it to the full potential. Not a place, like some of have said over this time. Don't have people with. Working to make the beauty for or otherwise. All want to accomplish is making the orchestra of life. All have been playing roles as single note in grand symphony. Please, rise for the overture. Remembrance Epilogue Last word. The Remembrance Epilogue contains a single photograph of four unknown individuals with abnormal faces standing over another unknown person. Beneath the photo, there is only the text, We aren't going to forget you. Thank you very much for listening. If you like what you heard and would like to hear more, please consider liking and subscribing. It would be greatly appreciated. I still have a couple more discussions planned regarding the Syncope Symphony, so if you're enjoying these so far, keep a lookout for more of those. Also, if there are any other SCPs that you would like to hear me read, please leave them in the comments below. Have a nice day.